Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Um, We're in a difficult time right now. It's April 1st, and COVID-19 is no joke. Uh, We're seeing some of the numbers on TV, and they say the peaks are going to happen in coming two to eight weeks in different parts of the country, and we're going to have to really um, hunker down. Uh, The goal of this topic is uh, to discuss how important it is when you're on dialysis that there's not a lot of room for error right now because the healthcare system is becoming overwhelmed. Uh, Healthcare professionals are worried about, you know, their family. They are getting sick. There's staffing shortages. And uh, I know when I was on dialysis, um, I got a little worried when I went to the dialysis facility when there was the flu going on. Uh, now we have even more things to worry about uh, when going to the dialysis unit. And, and the goal of this show is to talk about some ways that you can prevent getting sick and also help the healthcare care system um, by doing all we can to be as healthy and germ-free as possible. <laughs> So today we're going to be speaking to Susan Vogel. She's a retired registered nurse, nephrology nurse. She ran a facility for many, many years. She's a big advocate of home hemodialysis. And uh, I'm so glad you're on the phone with me today, Sue. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, I even want- if it is remote. <laughs> Well, and you know, I want to I want to kind of go through the process of when you were a nurse administrator. What were some of the things that you saw people were admitted or got sick from the most? And and maybe we can kind of just go in order. Okay, so the biggest reason people were admitted to the hospital was cardi was always cardiac, mm-hmm. and often that was from fluid overload. Uh, fluid overload is uh, easy to do. I mean, you have to really stay on a strict fluid limit and watch your sodium and uh, pay attention to that um, because uh, fluid overload is, is it's easy. It's happened to me. You know, you could just drink a couple of drinks too many and eat some salty food and it can lead you to having some serious problems. So... You got to watch your fluid, everybody. <laughs> a- absolutely. I mean, I am. I was always in awe of of how difficult it is to manage that fluid, and how well some people do with it. I always say that if I had been on dialysis, they probably would have yelled at me every treatment for fluid overload. But having said that, especially right now, when we don't know how long this virus is going to be with us. We want to make sure our healthcare workers stay as safe as possible and our patients stay as safe as possible. I can't stress enough how important it is at this time to control your fluid. Well, and you also need to be aware of your weight and weigh at home and also alert the staff if if you're not eating as much, if you could be losing weight or gaining weight so that they can adjust your dry weight appropriately. Absolutely. I totally agree with that, Lori. And it's part of why the nurses do an assessment when you come into the dialysis facility is to see exactly how much fluid you have on and how much they need to safely take off with that treatment. And there's a lot of literature out now about the need to be very careful with how much fluid they take off of you for treatment, because if they take off too much, it causes what's called cardiac stunning and can really damage your heart in the long run. Well, and, um, you know, I can't help myself, Sue, but uh, I'm a big fan of the crit line. So for people who have the crit line, um, that's an extra tool that you can use. But I want to stress a little bit about sodium intake because it's impossible to control your fluid if you don't control your sodium. That's correct because water follows salt. Yep. So the more salt you take in, the more fluid you retain. 
And when you go into dialysis, even though you may be very swollen and you think they're going to be able to take all that fluid off of you, they can only take off the fluid that's in your vascular system. So right. unless that fluid moves from your tissue into your vascular system, they're not going to be able to take it off. What's the second reason you see people getting sick in dialysis and needing to be hospitalized? A lot of times it might be access related. If your blood pressure gets too low because they have to take too much fluid off of you or for other reasons, you may have some underlying conditions that cause your blood pressure to go very low that might cause your access to clot. And if that's the case, then that needs to get fixed. Now, there are a lot of outpatient vascular access centers now in existence, so you wouldn't have to go to an actual hospital itself. But keep in mind during these very stressful, scary times that the personal protective equipment that's used by hospitals and vascular access centers may be limited. Mm -hmm. So it behooves you to keep as healthy as possible right now while you're getting dialysis. And there's so many things you can do. Um, if, if you happen to have a catheter, don't shower or take a bath. Don't do anything to get it infected. Uh, <laughs> if you're having an access mature at the time, ready, getting it ready to be utilized. Uh, but also keeping your access clean at all times and covered. Absolutely. That, you want, that is your lifeline and you need to take care of it. And when um when I had an access, uh, uh, I had a graph, actually, they couldn't get a fistula in me, um, you know, to listen to it, the bruit sound, to make sure that you're listening to it every day and making sure it's strong and getting familiar with the, the particular sound it makes. And if you hear that it's making a different sound, maybe you can alert your staff ahead of time before there's any serious complications. Exactly. You should be checking that access every day. You feel a thrill and you hear a brewery. So you want to check it and you want to listen by palpating it, putting your hand on it, making sure you feel that thrill and you want to make sure you put your ear down to it and you hear that brewery. It doesn't even require a stethoscope. Uh, I, know I always like could listen to it. I'm like, oh, it sounds like the beach. You know, you had to be a little creative sometimes, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and it was really weird because when I didn't have the access anymore, I, it, it was because I, when I laid down in bed, I could hear it. It was very, very loud and kind of hear the vibration. And it was strange not to have that sound. It's, it's amazing how you get used to things. So, um, and then if you have a PD catheter, just do everything to keep it clean and um, make sure it doesn't get infected. Clean and dry, correct? Dry. <laughs> correct. Now, with a PD catheter that's healed, you can take a shower, but you want to make sure you do your, ac your, your catheter care right afterwards. Right. It's so important right now because uh, we don't have a lot of room for air, everybody. Um, let's move on to some of the labs. Um, I, I live and die by my lab work, and I always have a printout of what my labs are. And a couple of ones when I was on dialysis that were really important, uh, uh, the most important, is potassium. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about potassium? Well, potassium is an electrolyte that the body needs to keep, um, to keep your heart beating. However, when you get too much potassium, your heart stops beating. So it's very important because your kidneys clear that and your kidneys aren't working. The only way you can clear that is through your dialysis treatment. So if you go in center three times a week, you have to be very careful about watching your potassium. But I say that with the caveat that some people start dialysis and they still have what's called residual renal function. And they may not need to watch their potassium as closely as somebody who doesn't urinate anymore. So go talk to your dietician. Their dietician is a great resource in your center. Most people dialyze at um, one of the um, chains, one of the large dialysis or medium dialysis-sized organizations. They all have websites with all kinds of information on it that can help you with your diet and controlling potassium, salt, and fluids. There is so much information out there 
on low potassium foods, different recipes. It's it's just absolutely endless. Uh, phosphorus is the next thing. Phosphorus is, um, I always like to say, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Uh, phosphorus <laughs> won't get you immediately, but what are some of the the signs and symptoms so that people understand if they're eating too much phosphorus and not taking their binders at the time of meal, what what are some of the symptoms of that? Okay, so with phosphorus, it, once again, it's, it's kind of silent. You, you don't know what's happening. But what it's going to do is because you need the phosphorus for your bones, if you have too much phosphorus, you're going to cause problems with your bones, and you're also going to pro- cause problems with your heart. So some of the symptoms might be that you could be itchy, uh, but a lot of the symptoms are basically silent. You're just going to see them on labs. But know that they're working inside your body. Your phos- all that phosphorus is working inside your body to cause issues. And it's very, very difficult to dialyze out phosphorus. It's what's called a middle molecule, and the dialysis equipment does not dialyze middle molecules as well as it does a small molecule, so you can't really remove it with the dialysis treatments very effectively unless you're on dialysis daily. So, once again, it's it's silent, but you need to keep on top of it, and the way to do that is through your diet and your phosphate binders. Well, and one of the things that I had problems with early on when I started dialysis, but then it got, uh, it, it smoothed out, especially when I was on PD and home, was blood pressure. Because blood pressure, um, you know, you, you have to be taking it every day and uh, make sure you take all your medicine because you don't want to end up at ER because your blood pressure is out of control. Right. And that's true for high and low right. blood pressure. I think people need to be mindful of what their blood pressure is and if it's high and low and ask your doctor for strategies uh, if it were to go one way or another. Because I often see people recommending, oh, just drink pickle juice or just drink, eat pickles. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the best thing um, <laughs> to eat a lot of p- pickles and salt. So uh, you may need, need a little salt to pick it up, but really ask your physician because I am not a doctor. <laughs> Right. Well, that's what we used to do in the old days. Back, way back when in the 70s when I started in dialysis. It was we eat a use, pickle, huh? We would tell them to do the pickle. We would give them bouillon during the treatment when they cramped. But it was a little, um, it wasn't as refined back then, dialysis. It was, it was much more crude. Well, and, It worked, but, and the but thing not is, as refined is that- as it is now. The sodium is, is just entering your bloodstream and pulling more fluid from your tissue, but Oftentimes, when people have a lot, a lot of fluid on them, uh, they can be fluid overloaded and have a low blood pressure. So it's a little bit of a, um, you know, challenge sometimes to uh, uh, understand what your dry weight is. But to just really be on top of it, take your blood pressure, take your temperature every day and make sure that you're nipping anything in the bud before it becomes too big of an issue. Um, Absolutely, because this is not a good time to be in the hospital. Uh, you want to avoid that at all costs. You know, it's it's frightening when you see what's going on in the news. And, and kudos to all the healthcare professionals who are out there uh, on the front lines. Um, it, it really is a war. These healthcare professionals are amazing people right now. Right. To actually go into work every day knowing what you're going to be dealing with, but yet doing it. It's quite quite a testimony. And with a dialysis unit and the staffing, you know, dialysis units can encounter the same problems that hospitals have right now. And there may be times when you go into the dialysis facility and the staffing is not optimal. You don't want somebody coming in who's got a temperature, who might have this COVID-19, who could potentially transmit that to you and the rest of the staff. So there may be times, even though it, it it's the last resort, when your treatments may be shorter so that the staff that is there can get all the patients dialyzed because we know that dialysis is a life-sustaining treatment and you need it to, to stay alive. So please bear this in mind. Be patient with the staff. Understand that they're working under trying conditions right now. 
I I can't even imagine. Um, uh, I would just say uh, if anybody has the option to go on home dialysis at any point, that may be something you want to think about. Um, <laughs> learn how to do it yourself, and then you can complain to yourself, right? <laughs> well, I am a huge proponent of home dialysis, as you know. Yes, me too. However, it does take staff to train you. Yes, it Although does. Although, if you can go on peritoneal, because I'm a big proponent of all kinds of home dialysis, Peritoneal is pretty easy to get trained for. Uh, home hemodialysis does take a longer amount of time to train. But however, if that's what you want to do, um, then start by learning how to cannulate your access. Right. If you can cannulate your access in center, you've got a lot of the battle done. The equipment now for home hemodialysis is much simpler. It's not the same machines that are used in the clinic. And while it's kind of daunting to learn how to do it, the first step is learning how to cannulate your access, how to stick yourself. Mm-hmm. It's better for you and it's better for the access when you can do that. And it would expedite your being trained for home, provided there's a staff available to do that training at this point. And if anybody has any questions about that, you know, there's a lot of a lot of online groups that talk about benefits of dialysis. You can talk to home dialysis. You can talk to other patients, what their experience is. We have a lot of podcasts and information on our website about it. So do a little due diligence. And, and then if you decide you want to do that, talk to your healthcare professional about it. Uh The next subject I want to talk about is infection, because I think it's twofold. And I was thinking it would probably be a good idea to come into the dialysis unit with clean clothes on (laughs) and uh, and make sure you're doing everything possible not to bring any any germs in as we are trying to, you know, do universal precautions as much as we can. Um, Also, I've been seeing a lot of messages go back and forth. Does the, do the patients wear masks? Do uh, the staff uh, make the patients wear masks? And I think if, if the facility wants you to wear a mask, you should definitely wear a mask. But in a facility where they don't think you need to wear a mask and you want to wear a mask, I don't think there would be any reason why you couldn't wear a mask. Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree. And I think there's a lot of stuff on the, on all of the providers' websites now about this. Um. Just bear in mind that right now there is, um, we don't have as much personal protective equipment as we need in this country right now. Uh, certainly if they have a supply of masks and they want you to wear one, then you should, you absolutely should wear one. It's for two reasons. If you have it, you're going to prevent somebody from getting the COVID-19 if you're wearing a mask. Also, the other thing it does is it prevents you from touching your face. And touching your face is the biggest way that the virus is transmitted. Right. And we all touch our face inadvertently many times a day. So once again, you also want to wash your hands for 20 seconds. Yep. When you enter the facility and when you leave the facility. You also want to make sure that your healthcare team is, is washing their hands or using um, the hand sanitizers before they touch you. It's so important. And I heard that um, there was a mask shortage, and they were asking some patients to use a scarf or like a bandana. So there's some other things that you can use if you don't have access to a mask uh, to help you. Um, you don't want to suffocate yourself. <laughs> I made a I made a PPE mask uh, out of a Ziploc bag with some uh, um, elastic, and it's on our website. But I thought, you know, I just want to have this that, um, you know, it kind of falls straight over my face and and just wanted to have something just in case. Uh, of course, I'm safe at home, and uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm very, very grateful that I don't have to go anywhere. Um, I want to move on to... Uh, uh, albumin and protein levels and infection because uh, I've been seeing that a lot of people, you know, they're having, they're having problems of going to the store and, you know, how do you get enough protein because you need to keep your albumin up to prevent an infection. Can you talk a little bit about that connection? Right. Well, low albumin are going to make you prone to infections because you need that albumin level to help fight off the infection. 
And it has to be above four. <laughs> That's the goal, right? <laughs> uh, it depends upon the lab you use, uh, but four is a pretty good standard. I know it's um and you know I was really giving some thought about this because a a couple of weeks ago I was talking to some friends about there's all kinds of you know you may not be able to go out and get the right food uh, because of just the lines or uh, then there were a lot of delivery services like Amazon Prime and Instacart and there's. Uh, different places across the country that are delivering, but now they're having shortages. And um, uh, I think the solution or a possible solution for people is there's a great app. People have to get really sophisticated on technology right now. And I, I have an app called nextdoor.com that, that's uh, for my neighbors. And I'm so lucky because there's been so many neighbors that have offered to go shopping for other people in the community. And this may be a way that you can have the neighbor go shopping for you, somebody who's willing to do it. And then I was even thinking, well, you can't even get out to the bank to get money to pay them. But now we have all these different ways of paying people like through PayPal, Venmo, Apple Pay, and they're not that complicated. So if a neighbor went to the store for you, they could leave stuff on the porch and then you could PayPal them or Venmo them or all these different resources, um, trying to figure out how to get the right nutrition. And, you know, you need to ask for help if you need help getting groceries. Absolutely. But back to kind of your PayPal and Venmo thing. In the ideal world, everybody would be that technologically advanced. But a lot of our dialysis patients are older. Hopefully, they have family that can help them with this. But for some of them, those apps are something they're not able to do or even think about. I know. I know. It's um, Well, you know what, though? I'm going to challenge everybody to that because uh, I've seen some people get on Zoom conferences that didn't even know how to download an app. So sometimes because you need to do stuff, it makes you do it. And um, and if not, uh, you know, if you have a family member, but you have to get creative to get what you need. And, uh, and you I, know what? They can they can go. They can ask their social worker at the dialysis facility. All these dialysis facilities have Internet now. Maybe the social worker could help them download that or, or the dietitian or one of the staff right. that they have a free moment. That there are ways for them to do that if they can't do it and themselves. It's, and it's it's complicated, but once you get through it, we are going to be a technological world. Um, we are one right now, and mm-hmm. it's a great way to connect and uh, and get that newer version of phone if you need to try to plan ahead and and find somebody who can help you. Um, um, uh, find a millennial and maybe uh, have some hand sanitizer and six six feet away and then pass the phone, let them program it, pass it back. I don't know. I'm trying to be creative here. <laughs> no, I think those are all great suggestions, Lori. And then, you know, they just changed the rules of, of Medicare payment. I don't know if insurance payment is changing but that telemedicine is going to be happening more. So you're going to be uh, seeing your dietitian or social worker through te- telemedicine, even perhaps your doctor. So, you know, we need to get up to date on technology quickly. And I think there are going to be a lot of resources pushed into that to help people get what they need so that they can connect. I agree that I think telemedicine is the way of the future and what's happening now, finally. Finally, CMS, you know, has, has agreed that this is what we need. Right. Uh, it's going to make things so much easier. It's going to be a way for the home dialysis nurse to do her monthly visit with her, his or her monthly visit with her pa- their patient mm-hmm. instead of that person having to come into clinic now. So one last place to be exposed. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way for the doctor to do rounds. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. Telemedicine is what's happening now. To do an aside, I have a friend who needed to see a cardiologist, not a dialysis patient, and this was this morning, and they used telemedicine. Yep, there's a it's a it's a new world, and it changed pretty much in the month of March. <laughs> February was a different world, and now April is uh, is a new world. Um, 
to wrap this up, because um, the whole goal of this talk was how to prevent, uh, you know, being hospitalized, no room for error for people who were on dialysis. And one thing that I, I noticed in, in a couple of my friends, sadly, and I try to heed this advice, if you have any stability issues, use a walker or a cane. Uh, now is not the time to fall. <laughs> it's never the time to fall, but especially right now. You are so right, Lori. This I, is not a time, or what they say, pride cometh before a fall. <laughs> it's the quote. <laughs> you don't want to fall. You don't want to have to be hospitalized right now. You must do everything in your power to stay out of the hospital. Exactly. For your sake and for the sake of the people who really need to be hospitalized right now and the healthcare workers. Exactly. And um, I was talking to one of my friends who's a healthcare professional, and I was like, oh, my God, the, uh, uh, the dialysis unit, you know, it's so scary to go three times a week. But he mentioned to me that the, the dialysis unit is much cleaner than a grocery store. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the good news about this is that, you know, people are on dialysis. We're very monitored. People are familiar with universal precautions. Everybody needs to take them. But uh, and I just heard on a conference call that um, people on dialysis aren't aren't turning up with covid and, and this was today is April 1st. So when this shows there, this m may change. But um, I, I think the fact that there was some early warnings for people with chronic illness and um, we're so monitored that uh, her, perhaps we um, nipped it in the bud and can help many people who are on dialysis be safe. Exactly. I don't I don't think it's the dialysis facility they need to worry about. I think it's the outside. Right. The people on the beach at spring break and stuff thinking that there are uh, no cares in the world. But hopefully people will stay safe at home and uh, we're going to get through this. And so I thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to just kind of share this information. Um, if you have any other ideas of how to stay out of the hospital that we didn't bring up, um, please let us know. We'll, we'll get them out to the community. And uh, thanks again, Sue, for uh, being a dedicated renal care professional for many, many years and, and also continuing to help RSN through your volunteer work. My pleasure, Lori. Just hoping everybody stays safe. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.